Your recent book, The Evolution of Everything, seems to have a democratic and anti-elitist approach to understanding innovation. How did you come to this topic? And how did you come to that conclusion about it? Well, The Evolution of Everything came out in 2015, and I've since written another book um, called uh, How Innovation Works. And I was already grappling with innovation in The Rational Optimist in 2010. So these three books are, in a sense, a trilogy um, of attempts to tackle the subject of innovation. Um, first of all, how it delivers increasing human living standards in The Rational Optimist. Second, how it's essentially an evolutionary bottom-up process. We make the creationist mistake of thinking that uh, we're in charge of what happens in the world. Uh, somebody's in charge, somebody's responsible. Quite often that's not the case. Quite often things come from the bottom of society upwards, not the top of society down. Um, and we find that hard to imagine. And then my third book, How Innovation Works, is literally an attempt to create a conversation about what innovation is and where it comes from, why it happens to us and not to other creatures, and um, uh, how to make it happen when we, when we need it. Uh, it's it's an incredibly central process to human society, but it's surprisingly mysterious. Why does that conversation matter? Why, why do we need to be talking about that? I think the pandemic reminds us why we need to be talking about uh, uh, innovation. Because had we done a better job of innovating platforms for developing vaccines or new diagnostic point-of-care handheld devices for detecting viruses before 2020, then we would have been in a much better position to cope with uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, in other words, in a world where we think we've had incessant and ubiquitous innovation, when you look around, actually, we haven't had nearly enough. I write in my book about two rather remarkable women who developed a whooping cough vaccine from a standing start, mostly in their spare time, in four years in the 1930s, and it worked extremely well. Um, whereas that would be quite good going today, nearly a century later. And that shows that far from living in a time of incessant innovation, um, we aren't. We've discovered incredible things about genomics, DNA, etc., in the intervening years, and yet it hasn't managed to speed up our rate of developing vaccines. That's rather a rebuke, I think, to our civilization that we haven't done a better job of that. There is something called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, set up by the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust in 2017, which is tackling exactly this problem. It should have been set up 10, 20 years earlier. It should have been set up by the World Health Organization, etc. So I see the lack of innovation in society as a relatively urgent um, issue that needs tackling. So it's not just that things are moving forward in an unplanned evolution. It's more that things aren't moving forward at, at a good enough pace at all. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I, I do make the case that a lot of this, a lot of innovation is unplanned, a lot of it is unpredictable. Um, but there is no doubt that if you uh, want to, that, that you can slow it down in certain areas, you can get in its way. So I think it's not a question of speeding it up by throwing resources at it so much as slowing it down by throwing obstacles in its way. If you, case, if you take the case of medical devices, it takes for between 40 and 70 months to get uh, licensing approval for a new medical device in most Western countries. That's an enormous investment of time and therefore of money for an entrepreneur. And it results in entrepreneurs going off and inventing video games instead, which are basically permissionless. There's nothing to, there's no regulator. There's nothing to stop you inventing a, a, a video game. You don't have to sit and wait for bureaucrats to decide whether it's safe. Um, you don't have to spend a fortune on your application. Um, as Peter Thiel has pointed out, we, we have undoubtedly, with our regulatory gov governmental system, diverted the efforts of entrepreneurs from uh, some useful things into some relatively less useful things. The way he put it rather flamboyantly is we wanted flying cars and we got 140 characters. What does an innovative state look like? What are the policies that you want to see enacted to create more innovation? 
I think what uh, an innovative state would look like is one which cleared the obstacles out of the ways of way of innovators and entrepreneurs, uh, created the conditions of freedom, freedom of decision making. One of the ways to do that is to speed up government's decision making. Um, we are. It, it's extraordinary how often. I came across examples of where the government didn't actually say no to something, but it took such a long time to say yes that it uh, killed all enthusiasm for the project. So, you know, the blight-resistant potato that doesn't need spraying 15 times in a season that developed by the uh, Bayer company, or was it BASF? BASF, I think, uh, in Germany, um, went through a process of such labyrinthine um, Kafka-esque complexity. You know, at one point they had a, a court case saying, yes, the government was right to say it was safe, but uh, so the government, the, the EU was then taken to court by somebody else saying, yeah, sure, you can say it's safe, but you've got to rely on a different argument from the one you used because that one's out of date. You know, we don't, we're not disagreeing with the fact that it's safe, but we want you to, to think of some, some other way of saying it. And that caused another two two years delay. By the time eventually they got approval, the company had lost interest, packed up its entire biotech, agricultural biotech team, and packed it off to America and said, we're not interested, we're giving up on Europe. That's the kind of thing that's been happening. And it doesn't tend to get reported. And it's, it's, it, 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 it's a worry to me. And so we can do a lot better. You know, in this country, now that we've left the European Union, we can uh, change the definition of GMOs to exclude gene-edited products like the, almost the entire rest of the world is doing. Uh, we can uh, simplify the procedures for approving or disapproving of technologies. Uh, we can create um, standards to help innovators get going. That's another way. You know, I write in the book about the innovation of, of container shipping. Uh, that was really effectively the, the, the creation of a standard-sized container to go on ships and lorries. Um, uh, there are all sorts of imaginative ways we could do that. But it should be focused on the, the needs of the entrepreneur and business rather than stimulating research at the academic end in universities. We do a lot of that already. It's very important. It needs doing. But it's not, it's not the limiting step, in my view. Stories of... Um, individual innovators like James Dyson or Elon Musk, are they useful heroes or are they dangerous myths? <laughs> um, I, on the whole, don't believe in the, in the great man theory of history. I think Napoleon was a product of the French Revolution as much as he was a cause of the Napoleonic Wars. In other words, had he not existed, some other strong man would have been thrown up by it. This was the argument that um, was tackled at length by Tolstoy. Um, uh, clearly, there are exceptions to that. Individuals can uh, bend history to their will from time to time. But I think one of the areas where we've made a mistake is in deifying innovators and inventors and entrepreneurs. Eureka moments occurring to brilliant individuals who happen to be extra special creative types is a myth in various ways. A, it's not true. There are lots of people who helped them, uh, and there are lots of people who followed them and made it possible. Um, B, it was much more of a collective uh, enterprise. And C, it tends to send the message to people that don't apply to be an innovator unless you happen to be someone with this special juice inside you called creativity. And I think that's a myth. I think if you look at what Edison did or Bezos did, Jeff Bezos, the, the Amazon founder, it was hard work, trial and error, failure, lots of it, bouncing back from failure, change of direction, serendipity, bit of luck, a lot of conversation with other people, a lot of collaboration. Well, anyone can do those things. So I'm keen to... to demythologize uh, innovators and I think we're, all, we're still putting them on a pedestal too much and I would I would give Elon Musk as an example of that some of Elon Musk's achievements are remarkable and great others such as his suggestion that we should uh, do intercity travel at 700 mph in vacuum tubes uh, on struts above the ground and this would be cheaper than either airplanes or trains is just idiotic um, so we should say so <laughs> 
is your view of innovation a positive one? You know, will we, will we be able to save the world if that's the case? I think there is no doubt that innovation has been a force for good in the last few centuries. You can put nuclear weapons on the table uh, and I can put uh, antibiotics on the table. I'm pretty sure my heap would be bigger than yours by the end of the game. Um, uh, and one of the reasons for that is because inventing nasty bad things uh, isn't going to catch on as well. People don't want nasty bad things as much. Some do, crooks do, but they're working in secret. They're not able to share their ideas. They don't get as much money, etc. So on the whole, um, good will trump bad uh, in the race to innovate. I think there's every reason to think that will continue. I'm seeing innovations all the time. There's a, uh, there's a new f uh, idea using bacteria to fix nitrogen on crops, which means we don't need to make synthetic fertilizer uh, that's out there in the last couple of years. CRISPR, the gene editing technology, some of the things that are being done with AI to um, uh, enable the diagnosis of cancers much earlier and much more accurately. You know, the, we, we're going to live through some pretty wonderful innovations in the next few decades, and it's the only way we're going to solve some of our problems. I mean, if we're really serious about solving the problem of carbon dioxide emissions, we're only going to do it through innovation. We're not going to do it through rolling out existing technologies. They're, they're not good enough. They're not strong enough. They're not cheap enough. We're going to have to invent carbon capture and storage or better forms of nuclear power or some other form of energy generation. Who are your heroes? Who who <laughs> who stands out for you? Who, who do you keep coming back to in your head? Well, having said that I don't believe in heroes on the whole, uh, it would be a bit hypocritical for me to single out uh, innovators. But I, I do think Thomas Edison is a remarkable figure because he spotted that innovation is a, is a product that you can make in a factory. Uh, and he set about it in just the right way, not not trying to be too clever, just trying to try hard and uh, do a lot of trial and error. And I would put Jeff Bezos in a similar category as someone who uh, has created an enormous benefit to the world in the form of online retail. Uh, he's, you know, he's, uh, he's broken a few eggs to make his omelette, if you like, along the way. Um, but he has done so uh, with great single-mindedness and achievement. But actually, I'm going to duck the question a little bit about my heroes by mentioning a heroic innovation itself. And the guy who did it, who is not a household name, although I'm trying to make him one, uh, and that is the insecticide-treated bed net, which has completely reversed the trend in malaria deaths in the world. Until 2003, they were increasing. Since then, they've been rapidly decreasing. That was the year the Gates Foundation started rolling out this technology. It's a very simple, low-tech, low-cost solution. It's been twice as effective as every other measure put together to try and uh, solve malaria. And it came about because of a, a, an experiment done in Burkina Faso in 1983 uh, by a bunch of French scientists uh, working with one Vietnamese colleague and some Burkina Faso colleagues, um, uh, which just did an experiment to find out if adding insecticide to a mosquito net helped, uh, particularly if the mosquito net was already torn. And the answer was it helped enormously. It was a huge, de huge deterrent to um, mosquitoes and quite safe. And so uh, Frederick Dariot, who did that experiment, and it was never properly published. I managed to track down the original mimeographed report of it. Uh, I managed to contact him in retirement, uh, and I you know, asked him how he came to do it and what the impact was, etc. My French isn't very good, and he's, his English was non-existent. That's the kind of guy that I think should be my hero in the world of innovation. What's next for you after the trilogy? What's to follow? I will write another book at some point. Um, it, it, at the moment, it seems to take me about five years to get around to publishing another book. So don't hold your breath. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.